Praise the Lord. Ancient words. It's to that word that we want to turn right now. Uh, when we're talking about goodness, not guilt, we find this truth in Romans chapter two. And so because we're on this format, we're not going to have the advantage of being able to switch between the slides back and forth. But break this out. If you have your Bible, get your own, get that scripture. I am going to read it aloud if you do not have access to one. But we're going to be walking through the word today. This ancient word in Romans chapter two. We're going to look at verse number four as our anchor text. Romans chapter two and in verse number four is where we find the source of our thought. I'm going to read together. I'm going to ask if you would join me. Let's read, family. What does it say in verse four? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. We're talking about goodness, not guilt. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity. I thank you for the technology. And I thank you for the heart that you've given everyone who is watching live right now. And I thank you for everyone who is watching this later. And that this word, as ancient as it is, it has not lost its inspiration. It has not lost its truth. And it's not lost its power. And it reminds us, Jesus, of the power of your blood, the love that you shed for us, not the blood, the love that you shed so that we could be covered and we could be changed. I'm praying today that you will open our eyes and help us to see you with new eyes. Give us a new vision of who you really are and father, how you really feel about your children and how you save us. And so this is my prayer and this is our promise because it's what you are saying to us now through your word. Amen. Amen. I am uh, interesting enough, even as we're outside here this afternoon, I wouldn't really consider myself an outdoorsman. I like being outside. I love going outside. I like walking and hiking. But I, I guess I'm not the classic outdoorsman. Um, and the reason why I say that is because when I think about outdoorsmen, I just kind of think of somebody who's outside hunting and fishing. And um, as a vegan, <laughs> we do all our hunting in the garden and uh, in the produce section. Um, but I did have the opportunity growing up a couple of times, one time in particular, I remember uh, being able to go fishing, if you want to call it that, standing on a, a bridge in, in a park uh, in, a, in a subdivision and um, taking a pole and getting a fish that was smaller than this Bible. And um, so that's what I, don't, I think this qualifies me as an outdoorsman. But I do know this uh, from what I have observed with other fishermen and fisherwomen and women and fisher people is a fisherman is really only as good as their bait. You know, if, you, if you've got the right place, if you've got a, a big boat or a little boat, if you've got a, you know, a thousand dollar pole or some pole that you made up, you know, from watching Little House on the Prairie with a stick and a string on it, um, no matter what those variables are, if you've got the right bait, you should be in good shape. If you've got the right bait, you may not win a Bassmaster competition, but you won't go hungry uh, if that's how you're going to eat. Because it's the bait that draws the fish to the pole. And when I think about our creator, when I think about now our redeemer, who even though he has made us and, and we belong to him, he lost us. And so now the creator has this paradigm now where he, as the redeemer, has to think of, OK, I made them the first time, but how can I get them back? How can I lure them to my love? Not just reach down and grab them. He could do that. He could go and just grab a fish and, and grab a, 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 some kind of animal that you get and, and say, this, you're mine now and, and you belong to me. But that wouldn't work in the long term. Because what do fish do when you, once they realize that, oh man, I got hooked on a bait or I'm hooked on a hook, what do they want to do? They want to get back into the water. They want to jump away. And so our father has this, this, this paradox that he has to deal with to where I want them in the boat more than anything, not, not to eat them, but to love them. But how can I get them into the boat so they'll want to stay in the boat? And I believe that one of the reasons why he gave us Romans chapter two and, and the ethos and the thought of Romans chapter two, verse four, 
is so that we could recognize that as much as God wants us to get into the boat, into a relationship with him, he really wants us to stay in a relationship. And so that bait is not just designed to, to trick us and then we realize, oh, I'm on the hook, but it's too late. But that bait is designed to not just get us, but to keep us into relationship. And I believe that a lot of us are struggling in our walk and that there are even more who are running from the boat because they don't have an understanding of the bait. They don't have an understanding of who the fisherman really is. I know that's a fact because even the great fisherman, when Jesus walked on this earth for 30 years, people knew, didn't know who he was. And for the three and a half years that he was in ministry, people didn't understand who he was. So Jesus had, I mean, he had the ultimate struggle. Folks who didn't even know who I am and, and then others don't even know who I, who I am from the inside out. They don't know who, who I be. I know that's bad English, but, but I think you get the point. So let's look at the bait. And I think by understanding what God wants to use to not just save us, but to sanctify us, not just to pull us out of sin, but to keep us from sin, is his goodness. It's the goodness of God. We read it there in Romans chapter two, verse four. Now let's read it again with new eyes. He says what in Romans chapter two, verse four, he says, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance of long suffering, excuse me, and forbearance and long suffering. That's a conjunction. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Not lures, another four-letter word, leads. And what it is that leads is his goodness. Now, now, this is deep because what it's showing us of all the tools, you know, because when, you, when you've got a fisherman, for what I've observed, fishermen have a box. I think they call it the tackle box. And in the tackle box, they've got all the toys that they use to try to win that big one or to get the fish in. So you think of all of the toys and all of the tools and all of the trinkets that the creator could use, the one that he uses is goodness. Why would he use that one? Because he wants us to see, oh, lost fish. <laughs> he wants us to see that he is good. Yes, God is good. Let's go to the Bible to understand this. When you go to Galatians chapter five, in Galatians chapter five, we normally go to this chapter to understand what are called the fruit of the spirit. This is interesting because we have a multiplicity of items that are mentioned in the singular. The Bible doesn't say the fruits of the spirit. It says the fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter five. And in Galatians five, verse 22, look at what it says. It says here, now the fruit of the spirit are these. Let me get there in a moment. In spite of the wind, the fruit of the spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. This is God's tackle box. This is what's in the heart of our creator and our redeemer. And he can't change that. That's who he is. But he doesn't say, this is who I am. He says, this is, not excuse me. He doesn't say, this is what I have. He's saying here in Galatians, this is who I am. I am good. I am goodness. That's why it works out really, it works out really well in the English, how you cannot spell G-O-O-D without G-O-D. See, everything good in this world has got God in it. We may not recognize that. We may not own it. We may not label it or proclaim it, but I don't care who you are or are not. Anything good that's happening in your life right now, God is behind that. Anything good that is happening, even in a bad place, anything that's good that's happening even for a bad country, that's not the person. That's not the country. It's God in that good. So you cannot have any good in your life if God was not in the neighborhood. Whether it's by direct connection or by Wi-Fi or wireless fidelity, somewhere in that good, you're going to find God, whether we know it or not. 
Now, what this also shows us is when Galatians 5 is telling us that one of the fruit of the spirit, one of the fruit of God's presence is his goodness. Look at what it says in Ephesians. Go over one book in Ephesians chapter two and look at verse number five. Ephesians chapter two, beginning there in verse number five. It says, even when we were dead in sins. Hath quickened us together with Christ by grace are ye saved. Who has quickened us? It's the God, the father mentioned there in Ephesians chapter two, verse four. So reading verse five again, God, even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. Then look at verse six and has raised us up together. The father has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, does this sound like a meanie? Does this sound like someone who's trying to get you in the boat to eat you? But is it better depicted as a fisherman? He's trying to get us out of the sea of sin and into the boat of blessing so that we can actually be saved? Absolutely. Verse seven says it plainly that in the ages to come, how good is God that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The reason why heaven is forever is because of Ephesians chapter two, verse seven. Ephesians chapter two, verse seven says that in the ages to come, God might show the exceeding riches of his grace. In other words, the reason why heaven is so long, eternal, is because that's how long it's going to take the Father to give a full revelation, a full disposition, a full expo of how much he loves you. That's how much goodness God wants to give us. So you think about our lifetime, our three score and 70, whether it's 90 years, whether it's 190 years, it could be a thousand and ninety years. It wouldn't be enough for us to fit into our mind and to fit into our existence how much God loves us. So he said, you've got to sit here and I'm going to show you how much I love you. But this time I'm going to do it without sin in the way. I'm going to do it without the distraction of death. I'm going to do it without your selfishness in the way. And now it's just you and me and me showing you how much I love you. That's how much goodness God has. You think you're blessed when you've got your bill paid. You think you're blessed if you've got a big house. You think you're blessed just because you've got a little toy in the garage. Oh, man, that's nothing. That's nothing compared to the goodness that God is going to spend eternity showing us how much he loves us. So whether you don't have that toy in the garage, whether you don't have that big house, everybody's got the promise through Jesus Christ that we've got that much goodness heading our way in eternity. But what about right now? What about right now? That's good to know down the road, but what about right now? Oh yeah, we can know how good he is because he chose us. Let's go to some other scriptures. Look over here with me in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse number 13. See, what you've got to understand, brothers and sisters, is that another way to understand the goodness of God is the choice of God. In other words, unlike a fisherman who is just going out to get a bite, God has chosen you. In other words, he has chased you down. He is hunting you down to hold you. He is chasing you down to let you know, son, I've chosen you. Girl, I choose you out of everyone. I'm choosing you. Second Thessalonians chapter two, look at verse 13. It says there, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren, Beloved in the Lord, see, notice the isolation here. It's not an exclusiveness, not in that you're better, but you are different. You're brethren in the beloved because God had from the beginning chosen you to salvation, chosen you through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. We're going to talk about that element of truth and choosing in just a moment. But you've got to recognize here that he chose you. 
little girl went to school one day and she was discouraged. She was distressed and the teacher didn't understand what was bothering her. And, and it got so bad, you know, she, when she went home, the teacher told the parents that, you know, just want to let you know that she had a rough day today because I think some of the children were teasing her because of her situation. The parents nodded their head and they understood and they took the little girl home. See, this little girl was was an adopted child and she was going to school and she saw everyone that had these mommies and daddies and and they loved her and, and they loved them. And, you know, then that was good. But but she was distressed because she felt bad because she was adopted. And the parents had to pull her down and and, and, and let her see, say, wait a minute now. Understand this. See, the difference is I and we, as your parents, we love you. And those children, their parents, they love them. But see, the difference between us and them and what makes you special is that we chose you. Out of all the children in the world that we could have adopted, we chose you. And the gospel lets us know that because of sin, we lost our parenthood, we lost our fellowship with God, but even though we were lost, through him we have been found. And so legally, we were children who left the family, but now our father has adopted us again by his choice, not ours, his choice. You gotta know that God has chosen you. And sometimes we think of the choosing, we only, uh, we only value that choosing if he's chosen us to do something really big or really special. The little girl was a little girl. She had no job. She needed to be fed. She needed to be clothed. She was totally dependent. And that was the parents' joy. They wanted someone not to achieve goodness. They wanted a child who would accept goodness. I hope you're getting this. They wanted a child who would simply absorb all of their love who would take all that they had to give. And some of us are trying to value our relationship to our father by our performance. Well, my dad only loves me if I grow up, go to school and become a big name physician. Or if I grow up and go to school and make a lot of money. Or if I grow up and become this popular or, or no. They loved that little girl and they brought her into the home so that they could lavish her with their love. So that they could provide every need. Dare I say, so that they could spoil her, <laughs> not spoil her to rottenness, but spoil her to righteousness so that she would always look to her parents for everything that she needed. And that's the kind of love that God has for us. He doesn't want us to love us up and then, all right, now go and, and figure it out the rest. No, no, let me love you up for the rest of your life so you don't look to anyone else to provide for your meaning, to provide for your blessing, to provide for your love. You've been chosen. If you still don't believe that verse, let's go to one more. First Peter chapter, uh, first Peter chapter two, first Peter chapter two. I know we hear this one taught a lot, but I want us to see it from the context of being chosen just because he wanted to choose you, not because of something that you've done. First Peter chapter two. Look at what it says here in verse number nine. First Peter two, verse nine says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness, <laughs> out of the sea of sin and into his marvelous light, into the ark of relationship. He's called us out. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. That's what the song says, right? But it's what Jesus lifting us, not me getting up. I'm grateful that I don't have to pull myself up by my bootstraps, but I can just say, Jesus, save me and he will redeem me because he has chosen me. He's chosen you. And that is an expression of God's goodness. Now, I want to remind us that when we understand God's goodness, God's goodness does not overlook sin. God's goodness erases sin. See, some of us uh, have the idea, and unfortunately, the enemy can purport the idea that God is so good that truth doesn't matter. In other words, he's so good that there's no way in the world that I'll be lost if I don't accept Jesus Christ. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches us that he is so good that he wants us to walk in truth. 
Let's go to the scriptures. Look at the Bible with me now in Psalm. And Psalm 26, Psalm 26, we're going to see how goodness always walks in truth. It is never divorced from it. It's never apart from it. But he is so good that he's good enough to allow us to walk in the light of his truth. In Psalm 26, let's read there in verse number three. Psalm 26 says, for thy loving kindness, his goodness, if you will, is ever before my eyes. And I have walked in thy truth. See, the goodness of God does not lead us out of truth. It actually leads us in to truth. He's so good. If you read down there, look at verse number four. Four to six says, I have not. Now, this is his testimony where he says, I have your goodness is before me and I'm walking in your truth. What does that look like in real time? Verse four to six shows us. It says, I have not sat with vain persons. Neither will I go in with dissemblers. Dissemblers are people who cause dissension, people who divide. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. In other words, you're so good to me, I don't want to do bad. You're so good that I don't want to do wrong. See, in verse five, he says, I've hated the congregation of evildoers and I'm not going to sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocency. So will I compass thine altar, O Lord. When he says, so will I compass or compass thy altar, he says, I will only walk around where you are. I will only go where you want me to go. The goodness of God does not erase our obligation to sin. Excuse me, our obligation to stay from sin. Instead, goodness of God erases sin from our life. That's that sanctified life. And I'm so glad to know that in spite of God's goodness, he loves me, but he loves me where I am. But that love does not let me stay where I am. I guess another way you can say it is come to Jesus as you are. But know this, you will not stay as you are. And so the goodness of God does not trump truth. It exalts truth. It raises it up. And so I'm glad that we can praise the Lord, but that the highest form of our praise and thanks for God's goodness is to obey him, is to love him. And I say this and we share this. And I believe the Lord is revealing this because I think some of us have become blinded to the goodness of God it's because we've got it mixed up in our head that because he's so good, he doesn't care when I do wrong, when it's the total opposite. And I believe that we will see him more clearly. We'll understand his love and his goodness for us when we really ask for deliverance from sin. When we pray against evil rather than relishing it in the back door or, or keeping it in secret. No, friends. He says, I will always have your goodness before me because I walk in your truth. And if you're finding it hard to see God's goodness in your life, ask yourself, are you walking in truth? Are you living a lifestyle or living in a way or practicing something that is short circuiting your vision and your experience of God's goodness? We got some hope for you today. If that's where you are, there's a way out of that. And if you're not there, praise the Lord. Be encouraged in your integrity. Be encouraged to keep it real. Keep it right. Keep it righteous. Because the third point that we want to share with you today is that God's goodness, that goodness is for us. See, when you read here in Hebrews chapter four, Hebrews chapter four and verse number 16, Hebrews chapter four, verse 16. If you find yourself, no matter what side of the spectrum you might be on, look at what it says there in verse number 16. Because of what it said in verse 15, that we have the high priest, Jesus Christ, our righteousness. Verse 16 says what? Let us, therefore, come boldly unto the, gro the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I love this. I love this because... Whether you're, quote, good or bad, verse 16 can be claimed. See, it says we can find grace to help when? In the time that we need it. Let's say you're somebody who you're walking in the walk. 
You're saying, Lord, I'm trying to see your goodness, but I'm just having a hard time right now. The enemy is at every step. He's clipping every ankle that I have, and he's trying to get me to fall out of the way and turn my back on you. The Bible says that is a time of need. You need grace, more grace than the grace that you got right now. And he says that you can find it. You can find that goodness in a time of need. But let's say you're on the other side. I'm not walking in victory. I am in sin. I am falling. I am living a life that I know is wrong and I am struggling. Guess what? You can find grace to help in that time of need. See, God's goodness is not just for the good. God's goodness is for us even when we're in the bad. Remember, not to stay in that bad, but to bring us out of that bad. And so no matter where we are, when you are in the time of need, you got God's goodness waiting for you. There's goodness on tap. There's hope for you because he only desires to give that goodness. Remember, we already established that. It's going to take him eternity to share that with us. So do you think that when you've made a mistake or a wrong turn or made a U-turn and gone back into Babylon, do you think that he wants to shut off that goodness? He's got more goodness than that wrong turn. He's got more grace than that mistake. He's got more love than your loss. I love it. Another four letter word for another four letter word. You just see loss. He's saying, man, see my love. And the way you can understand that is that Romans chapter two, verse four, which says, despisest thou the riches of his grace? Don't you know that it's the goodness of God? that leads us, that loves us to repentance. That's in the context of our sin, not in our salvation. So Romans 2 verse 4, that verse is laying its hand out telling you, man, now is when I want to pull you back in at the very time that you don't think I deserve or that you deserve to be with me. That's hope. That's the gospel. And that's why we wanted to focus on that today to understand it's the goodness of God not the guilt of our sin that leads us to repentance. You want to know where guilt comes from? You will find no scripture in the Bible that purports that he uses that tool. That is not in God's tackle box. We read in the Galatians chapter five, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, self-control. I didn't see guilt in that tackle box. Oh, so where does guilt come from? Guilt comes from Satan and sin. That is not a tool that God uses to bring us back to him. Well, Chris, what's the difference between guilt and conviction? Ah, yeah, that's what he will use. See, when I recognize, you know, even even now, when when I I was trying to figure out where we're going to go so we could share together today, and there are these little red bugs. We looked it up one time on and to find out what their name, but there are these little red bugs all over these stones that I'm sitting on. And so when I sat down and when I put the paper down, uh, it had all of this red blood from the bugs that were that were there. Now, that that stain or the stains on my pants or the stains that let me know, uh oh, I need to put something down or I may not even want to sit here. I didn't feel guilt. I felt convicted. In other words, it was a revelation of a truth that, uh oh, I need to do something different if I don't want to get these marks all over my stuff. See what conviction, the work of the spirit, as he promised in John 13, John 14, John 15, that spirit would not just show you what is wrong. But what does it say? Look at that verse. Go back with me real quick. Trying to understand the difference between conviction and guilt. John chapter 15. What did he say? Jesus promised that by his presence, he says in John chapter 15. I don't know if it's John 15 or John 14. It says there, yeah, 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 John 14. Look at John 14 and verse number 26. He says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, the Father will send him in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Skipping over one chapter, talking about conviction, not guilt. Chapter 15, it says there in verse number 26, but when the comforter is come, 
whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. In other words, he says, what I'm telling you is that what conviction does is conviction does not just let you know who you are, but it shows you where you need to be. It leads you and guides you into truth. That's conviction. What guilt does, it says, oh, look at those red bugs all over your paper, all over your pants, all over you. You are no good. You are dirty. You are just messed up. That's Satan. God has no part in that. That is not a revelation of truth. He does not use truth to put you down. He uses truth to show you how he can bring you up. That's what conviction does. And godly conviction exposes our mess so that he can clean it up. Guilt says you made a mess. Now you got to figure out how you're going to clean it up. And what the devil loves to do is to get you in a sin, get you doing that sin, and then pull the covers back and expose you. Because what he hopes to do now is to trap you in what's called the cycle of shame to where he exposes the wrong that you've done. And then says, Chris, you got to figure out how you're going to get out of this, knowing full well you can't get yourself out of it and knowing full well he's not going to do anything to help you get out of it. In fact, he's going to help you get into it. And that was creates that addiction. That's what creates that bondage. And that's what creates the slavery of sin. We don't want any part of that. Because Jesus has no part in guilt. He has a part. In fact, his whole purpose, and his whole point is goodness. I'm going to love you into a commitment with me. How can we experience that? We're going to close today looking at this, not the cycle of addiction, but this hope. This hope that is supposed to be based and rooted in God's goodness. Let's go to the Bible. As we wrap this up, I want to go to Psalm 27. You and I, no matter where you are, you can hope in God's goodness. Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Three steps of hoping in goodness. We want to get out of guilt. Some of us are caught in guilt cycles. Some of us are, are burdened with guilt, just like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. You're wearing this stuff on your back. And it's unfortunately, it's easy to remember it because there's always somebody around you trying to remind you of it. I want to encourage you. And I also want to discourage you on the same token. If you find yourself as a dissenter or a dissembler or a person who is pulling someone else down, how do you know when you're pulling someone else down? When you're constantly reminding people of the past or when you're constantly thinking of the past, that's an indicator. That's a squeak in your body. That's inflammation in your soul, letting you know that you are not standing in the goodness of God. And because you are not standing in the goodness of God, you cannot extend that goodness to other people. And so I want to admonish us today that if you know that that's something that you're struggling with, I got good news for you. We got hope. And it's in Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Watch with me now. Psalm 27. We're going to take this thing in three parts. The first thing, how can I make this transition from hoping in God's goodness and being free from guilt, standing in goodness and not walking in guilt or even dispensing guilt? Psalm 27 lets us know here. It says in uh, I'm in Proverbs 27. <laughs> right, let me get to Psalm 27. Amen. First things first. First step, you need to hide. What did I say? Hide. The first step to living in God's goodness, finding hope in his goodness. It says. One thing have I desired of the Lord. Psalm 27, verse four to five. One thing it says, have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. You got to relocate. Getting out of guilt now, you got a nest. <laughs> You've got to rest in his goodness. We'd have to hide, David says here, in the house of the Lord. 
He's not dealing with the physical building like you might see behind me here on campus. He's talking about being in the presence of God. And one of the fruit of the presence of God is his goodness. Getting into God's goodness, getting in God's good side. I, I don't like to say good side because it kind of insinuates God has a bad side. But that's the thing about him. He does not have a bad side because he is good. So front to back and left to right, north to south, east to, it's all, it's all good in God. And that's why David said, that's where I want to hide. Hide me up, wall me up, establish me and roof me in God's goodness. So we've got to say, Jesus, relocate me. Get me into goodness. You know what you can be so bold as to say? If it's the goodness of God that leads us into repentance, if you know you're not living right, if you know you're struggling, you can pray this prayer and say, Lord, bless me. I'm so I've lost my I've lost my speech. You know, how it's like when you um, if you go somewhere where you used to have an accent, but you move and you lost your accent. What do you do? You got to get around people who talk like that. And so if you've lost your blessing accent, I, I forgot what it means to just say thank you, Lord. Bless me so I can remember how to say thank you again. He'll do it. He will bless you. And if you hide in that blessing, that's your relocation point. That's your starting point. All right, man. Whoa, wow. Thank you. G All right. Now I'm, I'm getting that accent back. I'm getting that Thanksgiving back because I'm hiding now. In other words, like Jesus said in John 15, I'm abiding now in a different place. I've gone from guilt to goodness. So you got to hide to hope in God's goodness. What's the second thing? Keep reading in Psalm 27. The second thing you've got to do to hope in God's goodness. After you've hide, you're hiding or you're abiding in his goodness, what's the next thing? Look at verse eight to nine. It says here, when thou sayest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O oh God of my salvation, after you hide in God's goodness, seek it, seek it, look for it, pursue it, make it your focus. One of the reasons why I'm always telling folks to turn off the TV, I'm talking about turning off the news. See, back in the day when I used to say that, you know, I was always talking about crazy programming and the junk that's on TV. Now, that junk is still out there. But now I found that a lot of people, especially people who claim to be believers of God, they're spending minutes, hours that turn into days watching and listening to the news. And brothers and sisters, I want to I want to inform you there is news, but the Bible calls it good news, the gospel, the eon galleon. And that is the news that we need to be focusing on. And so what he's saying here that once I found myself in God's goodness, pursue it, seek it, thrive on it. Eat it. Like we talked about good nutrition. We got to have that good nutrition in our minds, the good nutrition in our souls. And we've got to seek things that are good, not just on a TV program, not just on a news program. I'm trying to always find what's good. Now, granted, you may not be able to always afford the best. But you can always get better. I'm going to say it again. I may not be able if I if I'm in a situation where I need to go from point A to point B. The best way to do that is a Learjet. That's like the biggest, most expensive thing I think that you can buy to get from A to B, a Learjet. And in Wichita, the, the air capital of the world, it's amazing how they have all these different businesses and industries that are designed around people in private transportation. I always thought it was about the, the Deltas and the Unites and the big. No, there's a whole nother economy, a whole nother lifestyle. That's the best. I cannot afford that. I cannot afford a jet. But there is something better than walking. And they're called cars. So what's the principle? I got a car. I drive in a car. A car got us here where we are now. So just because I cannot procure the best doesn't mean I throw my hands up in the air and just, oh, well, there's, it's, there's just all hope is lost. No, all hope is not lost. You just got to find it. And in our pursuit of whether we watch or, or what we eat or, or how we live, go for the better. Seek what is good. 
Pursue it. That's why there are ministries like Change and there are hundreds and if not thousands of others that we support and we pray for and we hope that you take advantage of and that you yourself practice to recognize we're all in this journey of trying to find what is good. So even though I can't afford to eat every single day, at, I can't eat every day at Whole Foods, doesn't mean I go and I eat from a gas station every day either. No, I look for what's better. I go to a grocery store and I try and find the best thing that I can, because for me, that better is my best. Brothers and sisters, to get out of guilt and to live in the good, we got to seek the good. It's not always going to come and hit you upside the head. You got to look for it. And you can't expect to find that good. Remember, if you go back to the guilt lands, you can't expect to find that good. If I go back to eating the way I used to eat before I was seeking that good. Are you following me? Do you understand what he's saying here? He says, when you said, God said to him, to David, seek you my face, my heart. David's response was, thy face, Lord, will I seek. And you've got to know. You don't have to figure it out on your own. Some of you are watching this video right now or you found it because it's a part of him saying, I need you to seek my face. I need you to come follow me in this way. And as we do that day by day, we will find ourselves much closer to heaven and much further from this world. No, we can't get out of it. Not until Jesus comes, but we can make a distance. We can create some space, some sanctified space. And that sanctified space from the world is created by pursuing God, by pursuing heaven, even in this present land. So we've got to hide in God's goodness. We've got to seek God's goodness. And what's the last thing? What's the last thing that we can do to find hope in God's goodness? Go back to Psalm 27. Hiding in God's goodness, seeking God's goodness. Verse 13, I had fainted, Psalm 27, 13. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Finally, wait, I say on the Lord. Psalm 27 has laid out a three-step program, a three-step experience of living the good life. Goodness, not guilt. The first thing I have to understand is that I've got to hide. I've got to run from my guilt and go into Christ. I've got to run from my past by simply living in a promised presence. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ that saves from sin. The blood of Jesus Christ Christ that forgives my sin. And when I've relocated, I got to look for that goodness. I got to abide in that goodness and try, I'm constantly trying to feed that goodness. But then that last part was interesting. Got to wait. Wait on the Lord. Waiting is a part of the good life. And I, I, I had to learn this because I, I remember when I was in my 20s, um, when I, at that time, when I thought I was old <laughs> and now I realize like, wow, you know, I'm in my 40s now and I have to really ask for forgiveness. I say, you know what? I'm sorry, Lord, for um, for I'm sorry for thinking I was old then. And I'm sorry for thinking I'm old now because I'm still a young guy. Now, some of you may be watching and you're on one side of that 40. You may be in your 20s like, OK, so if he's young at 40, then I'm, I'm like really young. And some of y'all are watching and you're in your 60s or your 70s. Yeah, well, yeah, that's good, Chris, because I'm old. But no, 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 no. When he says I'm waiting on the Lord, no matter where we are, 20s, 40s or 70s, we're all waiting on eternity. And in a very real sense, because our life is just a vapor and it's just a, really in the whole scheme of eternity, the years that we have, it's really just going to be like a moment. We're all young. So. I'm saying that to give us some perspective to waiting, because if I'm young at 20, young at 40, young at 70, what's the big deal with waiting? If my life is a moment, then my waiting is a moment. See, we think waiting is hard because it just seems like such a long time. But it's if life is itself, life in this earth is not long, then then waiting's not really long. 
So what's the big deal? If the Lord turns to you and he just says, I need you to wait on that. Some things you're not going to have now, but what you have now, it's still good. It's still all good, but, but not this. That's for later. I need you to wait on that. And for me personally, I think I'm at a point where the Lord has, has, has opened some doors where I believe that he is, his, his, I, I, I'm, let me just think, okay, not just talk because now I'm personal. A lot of this stuff is Bible. Now this is personal. I believe that the Lord is blessed and I'm excited about a, 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 an opportunity to bless more people with something very practical and something that will help people put a smile on their face and let them know that they are loved. And let them know that in spite of all of the sadness and all of the badness in this world, there is one thing good. And, and what can be better than that than a cookie? <laughs> I know this is a stretch and we're going all over the place, but I'm just trying to follow the spirit and, and be transparent. Um, and I, I, I believe that he's blessed and there's a, there's a cookie that I want to give to the world. And I want to share with the world to bring joy to people's lives and let them know that God loves them. And hopefully something that's as small and insignificant as a cookie will open their heart up to receive the grace of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of their sins and to fill their heart up with a whole new joy through the presence of his spirit. I'm hoping that he can do that through a cookie. <laughs> and, and so um, real soon, we're uh, going to make available, um, a co I don't have a name for it. I just know it's, it's, a, it's a cookie. It's a carob chip cookie that. I believe the Lord can use to bless a lot of people, obviously to, to help and support our family in this ministry, but more importantly, to bring joy to the world. Now, this whole idea, this whole concept, this whole business mind, um, business plan, you know, I'm like, wow, Lord, I'm in my 40s. This is coming to fruition. And um, we're trying to take the steps forward with it. Um, why didn't this happen when I was like out of college and trying to figure out what to do next? And you know, my family has been so blessed. And the reason why I can say we've been so blessed is because we've had to struggle so much and it's been hard at times. And he has used family literally to bless us and to support us. Um, we were a one income and, and, and have been a one income family for the sake of the gospel or because I couldn't get a job or because nobody would pick me up or I couldn't um, get a conference job somewhere. Um, and my wife faithfully taught. And, you know, in times like that, I'm like, why didn't this idea come then? And I recognize, um, and because even at this point right now, it's just an idea. It hasn't gone to that next step. Um, but even now, I want to testify that he said, I want you to wait. Because even in your struggle, even when we were really hurting financially, I still had so much pride. I still was trying to fix things on my own. I still did not understand that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And it's not the goodness of Chris that leads to success. It's not the smartness of Chris that gets us ahead. But having to go on food stamps and, and having to go through Medicare and having to live with family and, and having um, to struggle it proved to me, I am, life is not good because I'm good. Life is good because God is good. And he's so good to use all these different things to get through my thick skull that I love you and I want to lavish on you, not because of something that you've achieved. I want to lavish on you because of who you are. I want you to accept, not achieve my greatness and my goodness. And now... It just might be time where he's saying, I want to give this gift to you so that you can teach other people how good I am and how much I love them through something as sweet and, and delicious as a cookie. <laughs> I know that was like around the world and back in, in two minutes, but I'm hoping you understanding the value of waiting. And don't look at your waiting as a waste or your waiting as a loss. Waiting is a part of worship. When he says, wait, I say on the Lord, it's a part of worship. The same one who said, wait on the Lord is the same one that says, oh, clap your hands, all you people, praise the Lord. It's the same one that says, wash your hands of sin and walk in truth. Waiting is a commandment. And it's a part of experiencing God's goodness. Just as much as hiding in him, seeking him, wait on him.
That's the word, brothers and sisters. That's the word that I hope that's going to set us free from living in that land called guilt. That's old. That's done. That's that's past. Let that be the let today. Let guilt become the past. Let it become your testimony and not your torture, because that's the work of Satan and not the work of our savior. With that said, brothers and sisters, I want to pray. I want to experience Psalm 27. I want to hide. I want to seek and I want to wait on the goodness of Lord of the Lord. If that's your prayer and if you want to respond to that, I want to invite us to bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for this word that you've given us. I pray that in the in the blowing of the wind, being outside and in my humanity that may have in any way interfered with your speaking. I pray that you speak and I pray that you have spoken. And I pray that you will speak to your children. You've taught us today that you are not trying to guilt us into heaven. You are trying to good us into heaven, good us into a relationship so that we will get in the ark of safety and never depart. Forgive us, Lord, for jumping ship. Forgive us for jumping the boat. And I'm tired of seeing my brothers and my sisters, my children and our family live in guilt no more. Jesus, I pray by the authority of your righteousness and your blood that you shed, that you would set us free from guilt and that you would open our eyes to see your good. Even now, I pray that you will bless everyone who is listening to this message right now, whether live or down the road, bless them and let the blessing be in such a way that when it happens, they know this is your goodness. Nothing to do with anything I've said. I didn't even pray for this. It was bigger than my prayer, better than my prayer, but you gave it. It could be as small as finding our keys when we get scared and we get upset and we start looking around and we forget to pray. But still, oh, there they are right there on the dashboard. Oh, there they are right in my coat pocket. That's the goodness of God. Something as small as keys or as big as a business or as big as a ministry or as big as a new job or as big as a new baby or as big as a renewed marriage. I'm going to say it again, not a new marriage, a renewed marriage or as big as finding that other one or the person that we were. This is the one. When we were single so long, I don't know what the big blessing is going to be. I don't know what the little blessing is going to be. But whatever that blessing is, help it to be so that when it happens, we will know it's because of your goodness alone. Father, today we want to hide in you. We want to relocate. We pray that as you have forgiven us for our sins, set us free from our guilt. Put us now in the pastures of goodness and in the pastures of goodness, change the channel. We got to swipe the page. We got to feed on the goodness of God. I pray that you would nurture us and that you would surround us now with good things, Lord. We don't have to worry about what's the best for someone else. We just got to focus on what's better. What's better for me right now, Lord? And whatever that better is, help us to pursue it. Help us to seek it and by faith, walk in it. And finally, the waiting, the waiting, whatever it is, we got to wait on wherever it is. You're calling us to wait. Father, help us to wait on you, because that's how that psalm ended. It ended. And I pray that that waiting is a rest. It's an exhale. It's a release that we're not frustrated and we're not furious and we're not afraid. But now we have faith to wait on you in this good place. And in this new space to wait and that in that waiting, you will make all things known and whatever comes, we know ultimately it will be for our good. If you finish that in your prayer, if you finish that in your head, if you finish it in your heart, you're claiming that Romans chapter eight for those who are called out like you and I today, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. And I pray today that we will love you because you're good. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. Praise the Lord. The battery held on the phone. The skies held the rain, gave us lights that we could be seen and by his spirit heard. I am so grateful. We are so thankful for everything we were able to experience here today on the campus of Union College. So we just pray that you would enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. Again, want to wish all of our mothers, Ma, I love you. I thank you for giving me life and love ever since that day I came into the world. God bless you. Mama Sims, we love you. I love you. And we're so grateful.
to have a mother like you in our life. I'm so blessed. I got two mothers. When people go through this world, some they don't have, they have nobody. But I got two. And I'm grateful for both of you. And I love you so much. And to all of the mothers watching and to all the mentors who are watching, aunts, grandmas, mommies, Mr. or not Mr. <laughs> Mrs. to somebody to, to look up to say, I know God loves me because of how you love them. God bless you and enjoy your life because you've given a lot of life to someone else. All right. With all that said, we're going to wrap it up. Look forward to seeing y'all during the week. And again, um, make sure you go to changeministry.org. You'll see the recording of this. Make sure you share this with somebody else. And um, yeah, by his spirit, we'll be sharing more of the word this week together. So God bless everybody. Happy Sabbath. And until next time, remember that change is definitely good.